Thank you very much for having me tonight. Uh, I was really honored to speak to you. I'd kind of like to just start out and go through the where I was April 27th. I woke up that morning. There really wasn't, you know, much on my mind. I would say the biggest concern on my mind was the exams coming up next week. You know, we had worked hard all semester, and to me, that was a big deal. It, you know, it was a week of my whole semester's works riding on the line. And that day at five o'clock, everything changed. That was, you know, my life can honestly, I can honestly say it changed forever. We were sitting at our fraternity house where I lived and we got word of the storm. We, had, we didn't have cable because of that morning tornado that uh, Mr. Spann talked about. So we really didn't know, we knew it was coming. I kept getting text messages from my parents, aunts and uncles, brother and sister. Hey, it looks like it's headed y'all's way, take cover. And, you know, I kind of blew it off. You know, you live in Alabama. I've lived through so many tornado warnings that haven't ended up being more than just a few downed trees and lost power for a couple of days. So I thought, all right, whatever. I was actually trying to hold a meeting with the officers in my fraternity, which thinking back on it sounds crazy. I was trying to convince them to sit down and have a meeting at, you know, 515. So we decided to just, you know, stand on the front porch and see if it comes. We, you know, like I said, we didn't really know what was going on. Yeah, it sounds smart, standing on the front porch waiting for a tornado. So we're standing out there, and I look out in the distance, and all of a sudden, you know, I see it. And it was something out of a movie. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Twister with Helen Hunt and Bill Paxton. It's what it looked like. And we sort of stood there, stood there in shock, and, you know, people were getting their phones out. And then all of a sudden, something clicks in my mind. All right, we need to go downstairs. So I scream everybody to the basement. All 30 of us are running down there, mass panic. You know, obviously, as you can imagine, it was the first tornado any of us had ever seen. And we're down there, the power shuts off, and, you know, after a few minutes, we come back upstairs. Obviously, we were okay. This, we hadn't been hit directly. We knew. And we start to hear word, okay, it's bad. And so I'm thinking, all right, well, like I said, you know, what is it? A few trees down, the power's out. So we decide to hop in our cars and head that way and, you know, check it out. We hear that all these people are they're dying. They're trapped. Okay, well, I'm a strong young college man. I can, you know, I can uncover a house. I can pick up wood and try to find people. So we go as far as we can down to University Boulevard towards the 15th Street McFarland area where we hear it's hit worse. We park and we begin to walk. And as we're walking, we can tell it's bad. And if I get the clicker, I'll can I get my pictures. And as you can see here, as we're walking, these are the images that we're starting to see. And, you know, I'm starting to notice, okay, this isn't the, any storm I've ever lived through. And as we're walking, we're trying to figure out what we can do to help. And you look at this, I mean, we get there and it looks like a bomb's gone off. Trees look like they've been thrown around like twigs. Power line poles, which I've never even seen broken or snapped in half like toothpicks. Houses are crumpled like there are pieces of paper. And I'm just in shock. And we're staying there trying to figure out what we can do. It's, it's sort of mass chaos out there. And a frazzled firefighter approaches us and immediately tells us, y'all cannot come any farther. And we're like, why not? We want to help. He said, there's nothing behind me but dead bodies and down power lines. It's not safe. And you know, I hear something like that and I'm thinking, this is incredible. Like, I'm just, like I said, in shock. So we begin to walk back, and, you know, we're convinced we really want to help. We know in some way we can help. So we decide to get up the next morning and figure out something to do. As we wake up, you know, we rally up a few chainsaws, about 10 of us piling our cars, and we're driving around trying to find something to do. We're determined to help. Everywhere we go, the firefighters, police officers telling us, turn around, you can't come. So finally, we end up in the neighborhood around the Hackberry Hargrove area. We find an old man and his son who were trying to clear about 20 or 30 trees off their property by themselves with one chainsaw. Would have taken them a month to do. The 10 of us end up helping them all day, cut up the trees, haul them to the street, got it done. You know, we're leaving after that day and we felt good. You know, we were like, all right, well, we've helped. So that night at dinner, one of the few restaurants that even had power where we could eat, we're sitting there and my phone rings and it's our house director or our house dad, as I like to call him. He calls me and he says, hey, I got a good idea. We have all this food left over. They've canceled school. We have all this food in the fraternity house left over. Let's cook it, and we can box it up and take it out to the shelters. 
So I'm thinking, all right, well, that sounds like a great idea. I, uh, so I email all the other fraternity and sorority presidents, and I tell them, you know, bring over what you have left, and we'll cook it. So that next morning, I'm not expecting much. And, you know, we get a good amount of food. We cook all day. We box it. There's no real organization to our method. And, you know, we end up producing 1,500 meals that day. Hot meals. Our whole concept was we want to produce a hot meal. Something that when the worst has happened, you don't have anywhere to go, you don't even have a house to sit in, what's one thing that can make you feel good? Is a hot home-cooked meal, fried chicken, mashed potatoes, green beans, something that will at least remind you of what it was like to have a home. And that was what we were shooting for. And so that day after we finished our first day of work, we are sitting around and we start thinking, all right, we can do more of this. There's more here. We can really truly make an impact. So we're sitting around, how can we expand this effort? So we decide, all right, we're cooking out of one kitchen at the Deke House, where I live. Let's expand it to the other three kitchens at the other fraternity houses next door. So we expand our effort to the Beta Theta Pi kitchen, Phi Gamma Delta kitchen, and Sigma Nu kitchens. So we decide, all right, if we're going to do this, we're going to need a lot more people. We're going to have to spread our word. We create a Facebook page, a Twitter. <clears throat> we create a website. Our followers on Twitter through the roof. We end up with 3,500 followers, 1,000 followers on Facebook. It was truly incredible. Our website has 8,000 hits now. So as we were starting to work out the logistics of our operation, we decided, all right, well, we need a leadership team. So we set up positions like volunteer coordinator, where when the volunteers come in every day, they can say, hey, this is where we need you. A communications director that runs our Twitter, runs our Facebook. We have directors in all of our kitchens that are coordinating the food, and the way it would work, the food and the volunteers would come into the deke house, which is sort of the headquarters, and it also served as our pantry and storage. The food would come in, and then we would radio through walkie-talkies to what kitchens needed what food. It would then be carried to the four kitchens, cooked, hot, and then walked to the beta house, which is the center house, where we had assembly lines set up. So the food's brought in, it's packaged and boxed into to-go boxes like you'd get at a restaurant, and then put into bags. From there, it would be taken to our transportation hub behind the Phi Gam house where it would be loaded into cars. And through our Twitter, our Facebook, we were able to find out, and with a special help to Mr. Spann, find out who needed what, who needed hot meals. We took it to shelters. We would drive it out in the communities and hand it to people that were standing there guarding their homes. We would take them to the police station, to the National Guard. And through that operation, we, you know, the second day, with that expansion, we were able to produce 4,000 meals. So the next day, we were like, all right, well, there's still more here. Let's continue to grow this. And as you can see, some of the pictures of us working, let's continue to grow this. We decide we need to take non-perishable goods. There's such a need for hygiene products, babies, diapers, like Babies need so much, you know, diapers and formula, um, along with clothing, like I said. So we begin to take that. We begin through our national fraternities headquarters, we set up a fund, which we begin to raise money through. Because so many people would call me, hey, I'm from California. I can't obviously do anything, but I'd love to send a check. So we knew we had to do something to help be able to raise money. So from there, our, expansion, our operation continued to expand. And we, the following day, produced 8,000 hot meals. The following day, 10,000 hot meals. That day, after, I guess it was Monday, we produced 10,000 meals, we got a call from the city, and it was one of Mayor Maddox's people, the mayor of Tuscaloosa. And he told us a story of how, at one of their meetings, at the end of the day, they would have a debriefing with him and his cabinet, and <clears throat> he would, you know, it was always depressing, there was... All the talks were the dead number keeps rising, the missing keeps rising. And then somebody stood up and said, hey, the Greeks, they made 10,000 meals today. They produced one-third of the entire city's relief effort. And he stopped for a second, stood up, and began to clap. And the entire room ended the meeting in applause. And when we heard a story like that, it really motivated us that we were needed. You know, we were truly making an impact in our city. And so that really motivated us throughout the week, and we continued to keep going. By the end of the week, eight-day operation, we had produced 52,000 hot meals. We had collected over hundreds of thousands of non-perishable goods and dispersed them throughout the cities in the needed areas. We had had over 400 volunteers a day coming in and out of the fraternity houses, 
And our final money, we have now surpassed the $100,000 mark fundraising-wise. It's truly been incredible. But it really didn't hit me, the impact we were making, until I started to hear the stories firsthand of the people that we were affecting. And, you know, a police officer would stop by after a 12-hour shift when I'm sure he wanted to go home, and he would thank us, say, hey, you gave me the only hot meal I was able to eat today. The family that would come in after losing everything and be able to collect some clothing, some diapers, and, you know, not have to go shopping were so almost in tears, they were so thankful. And the one story that really hit me the most, that really made it all worthwhile, that made you know the sleepless nights, the long days worthwhile, we were at dinner. After a long day, and a volunteer search and rescue came up to us and said, are y'all UA Greek Relief? We said, yes. They said, I'm a search and rescue member out in Alberta City. We're still looking for people. This was four days after the storm. We're still looking for people alive. And she said, today we were looking, and when you look, you don't hear. She told us, you don't hear for screams, because by then they can't talk. They haven't had anything to drink or eat. They can't talk. And all of a sudden, they heard a toy noise. There's a toy going off. So they begin to furiously, you know, clear the debris. They find a five-year-old boy and his three-year-old little sister huddled in a bathtub. All they could say was, where's mommy? Where's daddy? And they hadn't eaten in four days. And the first meal they ate was one of our hot meals. And when I heard that, that really truly made it all worthwhile that we were able to provide them the first meal they had had in four days. And it truly made it all the sacrifices worthwhile. The one thing I still continue to ask myself is, what if we had left? What if when they canceled school, like the rest of our classmates, we said, hey, you know, let's go to the beach. Let's go to the lake. We've had a long semester. Why not? You know, we don't have to be here. We didn't have to be there. We were not told to stay. You know, what if we had left? Who would have fed all those people? How many people would have gone hungry? How many volunteer workers would have had to leave what they were doing to go find a meal? And, you know, 20 minutes there, 20 minutes back, that's time they could have been working. And I continue to ask myself that. And I'm so thankful that we were able to make a difference. And the one thing I just want to challenge everybody to do is that in a time of disaster, in a time when your city needs us most, needs you most, any effort can help. You know, we started out with 10 sorority and fraternity members that, you know, we took a small idea and we ran with it. We didn't have to keep going after that first day when we cooked everything we had. We, did, we easily could have just left. And we took the small idea and we ran with it. And we were able to be the leader in the relief effort for meals during the disaster relief in Tuscaloosa. And it truly was incredible. And, you know, we really, for the future, we are looking, this is never over. You know, it's, it's not done yet. This city will take years to recover. Years. These pictures don't do it justice when you're down there. And you see there's nothing but a foundation with steps leading to it, and there's nothing there. And it will take years to recover, and we are going to be there to continue to support them and help them. I can honestly say, though, none of us will ever be the same from this incident. Our Greek system will never be the same. And I hope the university will never be the same. We're going to continue what we're doing. And hopefully we can spread our message and become a nationwide event to where, our, to where Greek systems all over the country can learn from us that if God forbid something did happen, they would be able to respond and make a major impact in, the, in their society. Our job is never over and truly never will be over until our city is fully recovered. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.